I don't remember falling asleep. That's the strangest part. In the carefully regulated environment of the International Space Station, sleep isn't the natural rhythm of terrestrial life. It's a precisely calculated interval, as mechanical and predetermined as the orbital patterns we trace around our pale blue dot of a planet. We sleep when the mission clock tells us to sleep, wake when the system demands it, our circadian rhythms long since surrendered to the artificial construct of space-time that governs life aboard the station. The pods we sleep in are engineering marvels in themselves, cramped cocoons designed to cradle the human form in zero gravity, each equipped with ventilation systems and emergency protocols that whisper constant reassurance through the night. The soft hum of air circulation, the barely perceptible vibration of life support systems, the periodic ping of diagnostic checks. These are our lullabies in the void, the white noise that masks the terrifying silence of space. But when I opened my eyes that day, was it day? The concept seems almost quaint now. Something was fundamentally wrong. The wrongness wasn't immediate or obvious. It crept in slowly, like a shadow lengthening across the floor, its edges soft, but its presence undeniable. The standard hum of the station's systems was there, yes, but it felt different, as if the frequency had shifted just enough to turn harmony into discord. I am Eli Sandoval, flight engineer on this godforsaken station. That much I remember with crystalline clarity, though even that certainty has begun to erode at the edges. We were part of Expedition 268, a six-month mission to conduct a series of experiments in microgravity and maintain the station's increasingly complex systems. At least, that's what they told us. Six months of monitoring, experimenting, and keeping everything functional. Standard procedure. Routine. What they don't tell you in training, what they can't possibly prepare you for, is the dread. It's not the obvious fears that get to you. The possibility of catastrophic decompression, the risk of collision with orbital debris, the thousand and one ways that space can kill you in an instant. No, it's the subtle things that wear you down. The way the station's metal skin contracts and expands with temperature changes, creating sounds that your primitive brain interprets as predatory movement. The constant awareness that beyond these walls lies an infinity so vast and empty that human consciousness recoils from its contemplation. And the silence. God. The silence. Even with all our machinery, all our technology, space has a way of making you feel like you're the only conscious being in existence. Like you're trapped in a bubble of reality that could pop at any moment, leaving you adrift in something far worse than mere emptiness. But that morning, if morning is even the right word for it, the silence was different. It wasn't just the absence of sound, it was the presence of something else, something that pressed against my eardrums like a physical force. I released the Velcro straps of my sleeping pod with practiced ease, the material separating with that familiar soft hiss that had become as natural as the sound of sheets rustling back on Earth. My body drifted upward in the zero gravity environment, muscle memory taking over as I oriented myself in the module's confined space. Commander Ross, I called over the general comms, my voice sounding strangely flat in my ears. Static answered back, but not the normal kind. This was softer, more organic somehow, like the sound of distant waves or the whisper of wind through dead leaves. Commander. The commander's pod was empty, its straps neatly secured as if it hadn't been used at all. Jenna's pod, our medical officer and the team's unofficial counsellor, was similarly vacant. Only Danny, our rookie pilot, was still present, his eyes blinking away the residual fog of sleep as he drifted beside me. Eli. Danny's voice cracked slightly, that nervous edge I'd noticed during his first weeks on station creeping back in. What's... where's the commander? Relax, I said trying to project a confidence I didn't feel. They probably started breakfast early. You know how Ross gets about the schedule. But even as I spoke the words, I knew they were hollow. Wrong. Commander Ross was many things, but he never deviated from protocol without informing the crew. And he certainly never missed morning check-in. I made my way to the communications console, my movements deliberate and measured. 
Years of training had ingrained in me the importance of conserving momentum in zero-g, but now each motion felt somehow foreign, as if my body was slightly out of sync with the space around it. The console's displays showed nominal function across all systems, but as I cycled through the frequencies, ground control, satellite relays, emergency channels, no response, no static, not even the background radiation that usually permeated space communications, just that strange, organic silence. What's going on? Danny asked, his eyes darting around the cramped module like a trapped animal's. Should we initiate emergency protocols? Not yet, I replied, though every instinct screamed otherwise. Could be a relay blackout. Remember that solar flare last month? But we both knew this was different. Solar flares left traces, electromagnetic signatures that our instruments could detect. This was nothing, as if the entire communications network had simply ceased to exist. I instructed Danny to run diagnostics while I went to check the other modules. The International Space Station is essentially a series of interconnected cans floating in space, each module designed for specific functions, habitation, research, storage. Over the years it had grown like a metallic coral reef, additions and modifications creating a maze that only its inhabitants could navigate with confidence. The familiar handholds and guide wires led me through the station's arterial pathways, my movements automatic after months of repetition. But with each section I passed through, the wrongness grew stronger. The air felt thicker somehow, as if it had acquired a subtle resistance to movement. The shadows in the corners seemed deeper, more defined, as if they were slowly consuming the light rather than merely existing in its absence. Ross! I called out again, my voice echoing through the narrow corridor leading to the habitation module. Jenna? The silence that answered back had weight to it now, a palpable presence that seemed to absorb my words the moment they left my mouth. I passed through the node 3 junction, my hand automatically reaching out to steady myself against the viewport window, my favourite spot on the station where I used to spend hours watching the earth roll by below us. The view had always been my anchor to sanity up here. No matter how isolated we felt, no matter how far we drifted from everything we knew, that blue marble was always there, persistent and beautiful, reminding us of home, of purpose, of reality. But when I looked out that window, my mind refused to process what I was seeing for several long seconds. Where Earth should have been, where it had always been, there was nothing. No planet, no continents, no swirling cloud patterns or city lights glimmering through the atmosphere. Just void. An absolute perfect blackness that seemed to swallow light itself. The stars were gone too. The entire solar system, the familiar constellations that had guided humanity for millennia, all of it had vanished, replaced by an emptiness so complete it hurt to look at. Danny! My voice came out sharper than I intended, cracking with an edge of panic I couldn't quite suppress. Get to the viewport now. Danny arrived within seconds, his movements jerky and uncontrolled in his haste. I heard his sharp intake of breath as he took in the impossible view, felt the tremor in his voice as he whispered, What the hell? Where is it? I shook my head, unable to formulate a response that wouldn't sound like madness. The void beyond the window seemed to pulse with absence, as if it were actively negating the very concept of existence. My scientific training rebelled against such an observation. Absence couldn't pulse, nothing couldn't be active. But in that moment, empirical reality seemed as distant as the vanished Earth. It should be right there, Danny muttered, pressing his face against the thick polycarbonate window as if proximity might reveal something our eyes were missing. We're in a fixed orbit. We can't just... We can't. Get yourself together, I snapped the harshness in my tone masking my own mounting terror. We need to approach this systematically, run full diagnostics on the navigation systems, check for any anomalies in the station's orbit calculations. But even as I issued the orders, a deeper part of my consciousness recognised the futility of such measures. Our instruments, our technology, our entire framework for understanding the universe, all of it was predicated on a reality that no longer seemed to exist. We spent the next several hours, 
if hours they were, for time itself had begun to feel suspect, running every conceivable test on the station's systems. The results were uniformly, impossibly normal. According to our instruments, we were maintaining a perfect orbit around an Earth that no longer existed, in a solar system that had vanished without a trace. The first hallucination, if that's what it was, came during what should have been our third sleep cycle after the discovery. I had been monitoring the environmental controls, double-checking oxygen levels and carbon dioxide scrubbers, when movement caught my eye in the reflection of a display screen. My own face stared back at me, but wrong somehow. The features were mine, yet they seemed to shift and flow like liquid metal, reforming into patterns that suggested something else entirely, something that wore my face like an ill-fitting mask. But it wasn't just the features that disturbed me, it was the eyes. They held a depth that shouldn't have been possible in a mere reflection, as if I were looking through windows into some vast, impossible space. I remember reaching up to touch my face, needing to verify that my flesh was still solid, still human. My fingers met skin, but the sensation felt distant, detached, as if I were touching someone else's body through layers of thick fabric. The reflection mimicked my movement, but there was a slight delay, a fraction of a second that stretched into an eternity of wrongness. The environmental control panel beeped then, startling me back to what passed for reality up here. The readings were all normal, perfect, even. Too perfect. The oxygen levels, the temperature, the humidity, all exactly baseline, without the minor fluctuations that typically occurred throughout the day. It was as if the station's systems were running on a loop, replaying the same data over and over again. Danny's deterioration was more rapid and obvious. He began to report hearing voices in the static of the dead comm system, fragments of conversations that never took place, distorted versions of Commander Ross's voice calling his name. Sometimes he would float motionless for hours, staring into the void outside the window as if communing with something beyond human perception. They're out there, he whispered during one of his more lucid moments, in the nothing, watching, waiting. Can't you feel them, Eli? Can't you feel the way they press against the glass? There's nothing out there, I replied automatically, though the words felt hollow, even as I spoke them. It's just space, Danny different than we're used to, but still just space. He turned to look at me then, and something in his eyes made me wish he hadn't. The pupils had expanded to consume almost all of the iris, creating twin black holes that seemed to pull at my consciousness. Is it? he asked, his voice carrying an undertone I'd never heard before, something that reminded me of the organic static in our dead comm systems. Are you sure about that, Eli? Are you sure we're still in space at all? I had no answer for him. How could I, when the very concept of space had become suspect? We were trained to deal with the known dangers of space travel, micrometeorites, radiation, equipment failure. But nothing in our training had prepared us for this, the complete dissolution of reality itself. The discovery of the recording came during what our mission clock claimed was the fifth day after the Earth vanished. Danny found it buried in the station's computer core, hidden beneath layers of system files that shouldn't have existed. But it wasn't just one recording, it was an entire archive, fragments of data that seemed to defy the station's storage capacity. This shouldn't be here, he said, his voice trembling with something between fear and revelation. The timestamp. Eli, look at the timestamp. The files were dated across a span of time that made no sense, some from decades in the future, others from years in the past, all supposedly recorded from this very station. But that was impossible. The ISS hadn't even existed during some of these dates. I played them anyway, perhaps because by that point, the impossible had become our new normal. The first recording was Commander Ross's voice, but distorted as if it were travelling across a vast distance or through some medium other than air. Abandoned mission. Time anomaly. Do not attempt to re-enter. The message cut off in a burst of that strange organic static we'd been hearing in the comm system. But there were others, dozens of them, each more disturbing than the last. Some were in languages I didn't recognise, sounds that human vocal cords shouldn't have been able to produce. 
Others seemed to be nothing but static, but when played at different speeds, revealed patterns that made my brain itch. One recording in particular stood out. It was dated exactly one year in the future and the voice, the voice was mine. The transformation is almost complete, my future self said, the words distorted by something that might have been pain or ecstasy. We were wrong about the void, it's not empty, it's full, full of everything that has ever been lost, every possibility that never was, and it's, it's beautiful. I understand now why they chose us, why they need us. The human mind is so limited, but we can be more, we can be... The recording cut off there, but its implications haunted me. Who were they? What transformation was my future self talking about? And why did his voice sound less and less human as the recording progressed? As time continued its strange dance around us, I began to notice patterns in the chaos. The void outside our windows wasn't uniformly black anymore. There were variations in the darkness, subtle shifts in the nothing that suggested structure, purpose. Sometimes when the station's lights hit the windows at just the right angle, I could see something like text reflected in the glass, Symbols that weren't quite letters, mathematics that wasn't quite numbers. Danny had taken to mapping these patterns, covering the walls of his sleeping quarters with drawings that hurt to look at directly. They seemed to shift when viewed peripherally, the lines reorganizing themselves into new configurations that suggested movement, purpose, intent. They're trying to communicate, he said one day, his voice distant and dreamy. But our brains aren't wired to understand. Not yet. We need to evolve, adapt. The void is helping us with that. I wanted to dismiss his ravings, but I couldn't. Not anymore. Not when I had begun to see the same patterns in my dreams. Dreams that felt more real than my waking hours. In these dreams, I understood everything. The void wasn't an absence of reality. It was a different kind of reality altogether one that operated on principles our limited human consciousness couldn't grasp. We had run every conceivable test on the station's systems, and they all reported the same impossible data. We were still in orbit around an Earth that no longer existed. But what if the truth was even stranger? What if Earth still existed, but we had somehow shifted sideways from it, slipped into a dimension that ran parallel to our own? The more I thought about it, the more certain memories began to surface. Memories that couldn't possibly be mine, yet felt as real as my own name. I remembered other versions of this same scenario playing out, each slightly different, each ending in transformation. I remembered being Danny, being Commander Ross, being Jenna. I remembered being something else entirely, something that watched and waited in the spaces between spaces. The realization didn't come all at once. It built slowly like a puzzle assembling itself in the dark corners of my mind. This had all happened before. Was happening now. Would happen again. We were caught in a loop, a temporal eddy in the river of time, circling back on ourselves again and again. Each iteration brought subtle changes, mutations in the fabric of reality itself. Danny was the first to complete the cycle. I found him floating in the Node 2 module, his body perfectly still, eyes wide and unblinking. But it wasn't death, not in any way that medicine or science could define. He had simply stopped, as if he had finally synchronized with the void outside, had achieved some state of existence beyond the binary of life and death. His body hung there in zero gravity, but there was something wrong with its geometry. The angles of his limbs seemed to bend in ways that shouldn't have been possible, creating shapes that made my eyes water when I tried to focus on them. And his face, his face had become something I can't describe, not in any human language. I felt no grief. By that point, my emotional responses had begun to alter, to evolve into something else. The human part of me, the part that had been Eli Sandoval, flight engineer and father and husband, was receding being replaced by something that could better comprehend the reality we now inhabited. The darkness wasn't just outside anymore. It had seeped into us, through us, becoming part of our fundamental structure. Each loop stripped away another layer of humanity, replacing it with something older, stranger, more suited to existence in this fractured dimension. 
I understand now, in these final moments of lucidity before the loop resets again. The Earth isn't gone. We are. We've slipped through a crack in reality, fallen into a space between spaces where normal physics, normal time, normal existence has no meaning. The void isn't empty. It's full of everything that has ever fallen through similar cracks, lost moments, forgotten dimensions, abandoned possibilities. And now we're part of it, permanent residents in this museum of cosmic mistakes. The beings that Danny saw, that we all saw in our different ways, aren't aliens in any conventional sense. They're the custodians of this place, the shepherds of lost things. They didn't choose us, we chose ourselves, or rather, some version of us in some iteration of the loop made a choice that echoed backward and forward through all possible timelines. I am not just Eli Sandoval anymore. With each iteration of the loop, I become more integrated into this impossible space, more attuned to its alien geometries. Soon, I won't remember being human at all. I'll be something else, something that can exist comfortably in the spaces between spaces. The station continues its orbit around a planet that no longer exists, carrying its transformed cargo through an infinity of nothingness. And soon, very soon now, I'll wake up again, forgetting everything I've learned, ready to experience the horror of discovery once more. Because I am not just trapped in the loop, I am the loop. And somewhere in the void, something watches and waits and understands. The next iteration begins now, 